the Duke for. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be uh, one of the moderators of this panel. I'm uh, Deborah DeMod. I'm a professor at the law school. Uh, also with me this morning on the very other end of the panel is my wonderful new colleague, Professor Elizabeth de Fontenay. So what I'd like to do is uh, briefly introduce the members of our panel, uh, and then we'll proceed to have a conversation. So uh, needless to say, each, each member of our panel has an illustrious biography, beginning in each case with the fact that he or she is a graduate of the Duke University School of Law. So let's <laughs> acknowledge that. Okay, so uh, as you'll soon see, uh, one of the uh, things that's fascinating about our panel uh, is each has come to the position of being the general counsel uh, of a very interesting company, but each firm is very different. And each person's challenges, I would think, as general counsel would be very different. Uh, and the history, as you will soon see, of each of these companies is also very different. So to my immediate left is Anne, Anne Fitzgerald, who graduated from Duke Law School in uh, 1990. Uh, Anne is the chief legal officer of Cineplex Entertainment, which is a position that she's held since 2005. Uh, as Cineplex is headquartered in Toronto and is a Canadian public company. Uh, to Anne's left is Gary Lynch, uh, who graduated from the law school in 1995. 95? Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> keeps us Thank young, you, Deborah. Right? You just made me 20 years younger. <laughs> yeah, keeps us young. Been keeps a great us, day. Keeps us young, <laughs> Gary, being in higher education. Okay. So Gary graduated in 1975. Gary is currently the Global General Counsel and Head of Compliance and Regulatory Relations at the Bank of America. Uh, Gary joined the bank from Morgan Stanley. Um, to Gary's left is R. Scott Toop, who graduated from the law school in 1980. That is correct. OK. Uh, <laughs> Scott is the Senior Vice President, the General Counsel, and Secretary which is an additional title that our others do not hold. I'm secretary. Yeah. Are you secretary? OK, two secretaries so far <laughs> um, of Wendy's, uh, which uh, is a position that Scott has held since 2012. He previously was at Tim Hortons, which is another, is or was another Canadian. Is, yeah, that is correct. Strong yes. Canadian company. I was yeah. up in Toronto then, yes. That's yeah, right. okie dokes. And to uh, Scott's left is Michael Treisman, who graduated from the law school in 2000. Scott is the chief legal officer and chief compliance officer of Tiger Management Advisors, which is a registered investment advisory firm uh, based in New York City. So to begin, um, I just would comment that the, these, these are business firms that are, as I said, very, very different uh, in uh, scale, uh, in the nature of the business, uh, in certainly geographical scale and scope, uh, and in the, his, the history of the, of the firm itself. So Cineplex is a fairly recent firm relative to, say, Bank of America. Well, maybe, maybe not. We maybe, maybe not. years Depend old. Depending on, yeah. you know, depending. So I thought we might begin by talking about how you, how in, in your account, how you came to be where you are now. Each, uh, each one of us? Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. If everybody is saying the same thing, then maybe shift oh. a little bit. I'm, I'm quite certain no one's going to be answering the same way that I'm going to answer this. So 
It's a traditional path for me, right out of law school, large law firm, did commercial litigation for three years, loved the first two and a half, and then couldn't stand it, and really wanted to learn to litigate. I was you know, stuck in a back room like many young associates. So I went to prosecute, intending to do that for a year. And six years later, I was heavily embedded in multiple domestic homicides and loved, loved, loved that work, um, utterly engaged by it and then was done. And so I came back to, came to Duke actually to teach for a couple years at the public policy department, teaching leadership theory in New York and the, using the arts as the forum, which was just a nice break from practicing law. Married a Canadian, moved to Canada, started over, and uh, landed the job with Cineplex. I somehow convinced them that all of these random skills that I had would make me a good general counsel. They did not have any in-house legal at all, so I was the first there, and I now have my little fiefdom. Um, of the legal team it's, itself is just is 14 people. Um, and then I've got other teams like real estate and lease admin that I've dealt with and had report to me, insurance, uh, government relations. Those are issues that my team, or that I managed the teams for. Um, so it's not a traditional path of straight through corporate law into a general counsel seat, um, nor did I come up through a corporation to get the most senior spot at a company. I just, for whatever reason, was fortunate enough to convince them to hire me um, as one lawyer and then to let me build a team. So it's not your traditional path, but it's worked well for me. So, Gary, would you characterize your <laughs> path as traditional? Uh, actually, the, uh, there are a number of people who followed my path, yes. Um, I, I got out of law school, worked for a law firm for a brief stint in Washington, went to the SEC Enforcement Division, eventually became uh, the head of enforcement at the SEC from 85 to 89, so I was the head of enforcement during the uh, Mike Milken, Ivan Bosky mm -hmm. days. Then I moved to New York, which was uh, heresy in Washington to think that anyone would actually move from Washington to New York, and I became a partner of Davis Polk for 12 years, and one of my good clients when I was at Davis Polk was Morgan Stanley, uh, and John Mack was the president of Morgan Stanley. Um, there was an acquisition. He didn't end up as the CEO, didn't become the CEO, and left be to become the uh, CEO of, of Credit Suisse First Boston. He hired me there. I worked with Credit Suisse First Boston for actually about four years, five years, even a year after he left. He then went back and became the CEO and chairman of Morgan Stanley, uh, hired me there. So I went from Credit Suisse First Boston to Morgan Stanley as the, uh, as the global general counsel. And then when John retired, um, I retired out of London. I had been uh, stationed in London the last couple of years uh, as general counsel, but to look after our uh, London operation. Um, and then uh, really thinking that I had retired, I was then recruited by Bank of America, who you know, some of you might, heard that, might have heard that there was a banking crisis. Um, <laughs> and a number of lawsuits had been filed, and uh, so I, I uh, was enticed to join uh, Bank of America I think the only reason I probably did it was I was living in London and didn't realize that this you know, onslaught of litigation was going to happen, uh, which happened within a month after I joined Bank of America. But that's, anyway, that was my route. Having said that, there are a number of uh, uh, people like Steve Cutler, who was also the head of enforcement at one time with a major law firm, who's now the general counsel of, of J.P. Morgan, the, for, the general counsel of Deutsche Bank. Um, Germany, the Deutsche Bank, the, the global bank, is also a former he head of enforcement. So there have been other people who follow some more route to general counsel roles at banks. Okay, so Scott. Yeah, mine is probably a little more boring than the rest, because if you look at it, it is, it is pretty much what, at least back in 1980, you would call the traditional route. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that to necessarily to young people today, but I left Duke. I went to work for a law firm in New York City left there to go to PepsiCo, PepsiCo to Yum, Yum to Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons to Wendy's. So I've been in a similar interest, uh, industry on the retail side for, for quite a while and ended up where I am today. So pretty traditional, I would say. Mine as well, though. I, I mean, Scott, I'm not sure I, would, I wouldn't recommend that, that, that course of action. That seems like a perfectly appropriate way for hopefully people to get the experience they need working for wonderful companies. I mean, I, I worked at a law firm in New York out of, out of Duke, and then um, I went over to Citigroup, and then from Citigroup I went to Tiger Management, which was also generally all, all in the investment area. Um, and I, I, I guess I, what I would say is I thought the training at, the, at a private law firm was absolutely critical in terms of being able to do what I do in-house. 
Um, I, I was not, you and I are both are similar in terms of I had, I had never had any interest in being a litigator, so I have hopefully managed to generally avoid it in the course of my career. But I did clerk first before going to, uh, going to practice. And regardless of what area one goes into, I thought that was, I mean, that was absolutely a, a wonderful experience as well as certainly very helpful for me as a corporate lawyer. I've actually found that litigation experience was shockingly good training for being a general counsel. It's just one of those, those things that uh, trains you to learn a new subject very quickly and learn it deeply and then move on to another one very quickly because something else will arise and you'll have to manage that too. Yeah, it's not, people don't necessarily think about the litigation training as adding value to a GC role, but I have found it to be quite valuable for me. So uh, um, Anne talked a little bit about the various things that were, as she put it, in her portfolio and things for which she was ultimately responsible in the company. Uh, my sense is that the, that, that the account that each of you might give would be different for things that you are uh, responsible for and that fit within your bailiwick. So, Gary, uh, uh, one, one of your titles is uh, Chief Compliance Officer. Uh, it's, 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 as you may know, it, it was a really interesting question, the relationship between Chief Legal, Com Chief Legal Officer or, or General Counsel and compliance and the compliance function. So maybe could each of you talk maybe a little bit about specifically uh, compliance functions, compliance concerns within your firm and how, what the relationship between that is with, the, with what else you do and what you're responsible for. Well, I'll start because uh, you're actually working off an old resume. Um, oh. I, used, I used to, uh, compliance did report to me until December 31st. <laughs> Um, and the banking regulators have moved in the direction of not wanting compliance reporting into legal, although that was sort of the, tr the traditional model. I think we were one of the remaining big banks uh, where compliance reported into legal. In fact, when I joined the bank in 2011, compliance had reported to risk, but uh, Brian Moynihan wanted to, re to report into me since I had compliance reporting into me at the two previous banks I'd worked for. Uh, the regulators are on this kick where they don't think compliance ought to report into legal because they view legal as, as advocates. Um, and they, I think the, the unfortunately, the, their model of a good compliance person is someone who carries a bat and hits people over the head when they think they're uh, misstepping. So um, they, uh, they offered, after resisting this for a number of months, and I wasn't resisting it, but our CEO was, uh, they said, fine, Gary can remain as head of compliance so long as he becomes co-chief risk, uh, co risk officer. So it took me about 10 seconds to re recognize that I did not want to be co-chief risk officer <laughs> uh, in this environment. And I said, you know, they've won. Uh, so I, I, I don't have compliance reporting to me anymore. And I think there's only maybe, I think Morgan Stanley still has uh, compliance reporting as the head chief risk officer among the big banks. But um, I think the functions are pretty much the same. I, I, I'm not the corporate secretary, but the corporate secretary reports to me. So I have all the corporate governance issues. So uh, I, having said all that, frankly, what I've done for the last four years is, is supervise the defense of litigation. I mean, we spent, in the last four years, between private suits and the government, we spent $70 billion settling lawsuits coming out of the financial crisis. So that kept me very busy until August of last year when we settled with the Department of Justice for $16 billion. And we're now kind of through it. So I'm actually doing... Uh, fun things, uh, interesting things, as opposed to uh, just managing this, you know, mega billion dollar litigation portfolio. So, Scott, I mean, how much, how significant would compliance and then litigation management be in what you do? Actually, one, one thing, and it, it varies, it varies by company, to be honest with you. And compliance, we, we took a similar route, similar route in the sense it's, it's obviously nowhere near what it is in the financial services industries. But what we do, did was take it and move it over to HR, one of the reasons being no one likes to see HR anyway. So whether it's a human resources issue or a compliance issue, we figured that was the, the best place to put it. But actually, we put it there because we figured at that point, once it's identified by HR, then, then you know, from a legal perspective, we could, we could do more of an investigatory role. The, thing that, the other thing that reports to me, because really the way I look at a GC role, particularly in the industry I'm in, 
is, is really is a gatekeeper, all right? And that is to prevent the company from going off the rails in, in different things. So if you look at what we've brought into that is not only the traditional legal function, you know, securities, et cetera, but also quality, quality assurance. So the whole quality assurance department reports in, not that I'm an expert in any means on what the quality should be or what specs should be of products, but certainly once we've determined that and once we've determined what our position is on those and how you deal, deal with it from a crisis management perspective, again, it falls within that gatekeeper role as well as risk. And again, not that I'm the one that determines what the risk is, but once the company determines its risk appetite, you know, what, where do we fall within that risk appetite on new ventures, on expansion, on acquiring new brands, on entering into new products, on what we want to stand for from a sus sustainability perspective as well. So that whole gatekeeper type, type vision. But Scott, and for, for you, for compliance, for any compliance with securities, so as a publicly reporting company, that all reports into you. I mean, you obviously are not handling compliance with meat standards or, you know, the size of the buns, but presumably anything on the security sure. um, securities perspective is reporting into you. Because the concern I have is, I am the chief compliance officer, is so much of what's done on compliance is legal advice. And I'm sure Gary could speak to this, which is, you know, in terms of responding to uh, regulators as well as suits, you'd like to make sure that as much of that information can fall within the scope of privilege. Um, because a lot of the advice that is being given is crosswalks both legal and compliance matters. And that's, that's the biggest concern when you sever those two is you're potentially opening up a lot of it to be discoverable and you don't want people to be concerned about that free flow of information or how they're looking for advice because oftentimes it, it just crosswalks both legal issues and compliance matters. And Anne. I, within my role, it's, it's, it's interesting. We don't, I'm small enough of a company that we don't have a separate compliance group, but compliance certainly falls within my bailiwick, and I do manage the compliance issues. Risk used to report into me, and then we had some of the similar discussions that uh, uh, Gary was mentioning about where's the right group for risk to report to. So now I, we work certainly in partnership with risk, but risk no longer reports to me, which I was thrilled about. That was a nice exit from my portfolio. Um, but we do work close hand in hand with them. But compliance, I would say, fall, the responsibility absolutely falls on my team uh, without anybody having a particular title about compliance. Okay, so shifting a little bit, I mean, one of the things that's uh, you know, obviously of interest to uh, scholars as, as well as certainly to lawyers is how things get, actually, how things get done within large, complicated business firms. Uh, so one uh, theory that's in the literature is that, you know, the relationship between general counsel, chief legal officer, and management uh, is a very interesting one, not necessarily the same relationship maybe across uh, companies. So I wondered if then each of you could talk a little bit about uh, your uh, the texture of your relationship with management uh, that would be different, I would think, maybe in smaller firms than larger firms. Uh, you know, the global scale of enterprises like uh, Bank of America, and I would think maybe Wendy's to some extent would would be would make a difference too. Want me to start that one off? Sure. I I'm, being the small company at the table, I mean, we're a two and a half billion market cap. It's a relatively, you know, small company compared, certainly compared to the two guys to the next of me, to the left of me. Um, I don't know how large Tiger is. I, I definitely am on the management team. I'm on the strategic executive team. There's only seven of us. It's a small group. We're uh, very facile in that regard. I spend very little time these days actually doing legal work. Uh, the other lawyers do report into me and I uh, review everything that they're doing and work closely with them. But I would say that my role is heavily management now. Uh, it's certainly evolved in the 10 years that I've been at Cineplex. It started off being strictly legal. And as I've developed my team and grown, uh, as the company has grown, my role has drastically changed and become much more management directed. I love the strategic side of the work. I like being at the table and having a voice at the table about where the company's growing and where we should take risk and where we shouldn't take risk, and thinking about that from a management side as well as from a legal side. Uh, I am, yeah, I'm part of senior management. I'm one of the 10 members of the, uh, of the senior management team, so we meet weekly for several hours to discuss issues. 
Um, that was true, by the way, at Morgan Stanley and also at Credit Suisse. In fact, at Credit Suisse, First Boston, I was on the executive management team of the parent as well, Credit Suisse in, in, in Zurich. So, um, and, and in those two previous positions, I was much more involved in business decisions um, and because frankly there just wasn't that much there was litigation yeah and it took some period of time but for the last four years um, given the the litigation coming out of the uh, the financial crisis you know it's been you know I eat live breathe litigation that's that's what I do but having said that I'm still involved in business decisions you know if there's a reputational issue obviously if there's a legal issue we can control that but in terms of reputation uh, you know a PR issue just how it's going to play in the in the world so it's but I, having said that then again you know we're a massive organization we you know, when I joined we were 300,000 people we're now 220,000 people so we've shrunk a lot but still it's uh, it's, a, it's a large company with a lot of things going on so it's very much at a very high level in, ter in terms of the management my I have a, well it depends on on who I'm dealing with, and you'll you'll understand this in a second. As far as the CEO is concerned, we have a we have an extremely good relationship. In fact, that's that's the reason I'm at Wendy's right now. I had been up at Hortons, Tim Hortons, up in Toronto, and the CEO is is Emil Brolick, who I worked with for a long time at Yum. He was president of Taco Bell, and he left Yum to take on Wendy's, where he had begun his career because he wanted to to try and turn Wendy's around. Because as as many of you know, it probably it, it stagnated from I'd say 2000 to 2010. And he asked me to come down from Toronto. So our relationship is 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 very strong. We've worked together uh, ten to twelve years at, at Yum. So that is that is a very cordial and it's 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 a relationship such that we have the management team, which is eight people, but then there's a smaller group. There's three or four of us, depending on what the issue is. So yes, uh, I'm I'm involved very closely there. The interesting one, though, is that. And and that's a that's that's one where we we really look at things in a very I'd say, you know, systematic way. On the other side of the coin, we're owned twenty five percent by by Nelson Peltz's Triumph Fund, so um, that phone call happens once or twice a week, and that can be any type of uh, it can be emotional, it, it it can be being chewed out, it can be whatever the the situation is at, at the the current time of day. Now after three years. I think we have a very, very healthy relationship that that varies between, you know, agreeing and then violently disagreeing. But so, depending on what the the phone is, whether it's the CEO or Nelson, it can be two entirely different situations. Uh, I mean, my situation is, in in some respects, fundamentally different. I mean, it's about a hundred people um, total at Tiger. I work cheek to jowl with our CEO. But it's not. It's the the operations aren't as both deep and broad. Uh, and so, and the legal department is is smaller. It's only it's only about four people, and so that that really means, from my perspective, also since it's smaller, and it means that it's not a corporate environment. It's not a public reporting company. I have viewed my, when you're in house and in the alternatives business, you know, it is it's small, and the buck absolutely stops with you. And I've always viewed it in terms of if there was anything that I was really uncomfortable with, I have to be comfortable every day knowing that you know. I'll just take my ball home and go do something else because ultimately all you have, I mean, all you have as a lawyer, especially in, the, in my respect, is your reputation and you need to make sure that the firms you're working for are not doing anything that you would be unduly tainted with. Um, it's a little different given the scope and breadth of the organizations, especially that Gary and Scott work for because, you know, there's so many more pieces on any given day. There's so many things going on. But it's, you know, when you work at a firm where, you know, it's very much identified with our CEO, which is a bit of a cult of personality, um, it, that's a risk you have when you're working in a small environment. So I wondered also if um, you could each maybe talk a little bit about learning to be a business person. Right? And so, I mean, uh, it would, you know, traditionally what people learn in law school and then in law firms is how to be excellent lawyers. Uh, that's not really the same thing as making or participating in the making or shaping of business decisions. So is, did, did any of you uh, receive an MBA or have management at formal management education or is this something that you feel you, you learned kind of we would say immersively, immersively <laughs> on the job? 
I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, when I worked at all, I mean, I worked. You don't get any experience learning how to be a corporate lawyer. I would say, uh, being at least, I think you might now in some of the clinics at Duke Law School. You didn't when I was here. Um, I'd say everything I learned about working with the business, I generally learned at Citigroup. They really let me learn how to shave on their face um, in terms of understanding how the different departments worked. Um, I understood the legal issues associated with the different types of work I was doing, but I didn't have a chance to work cheek to jowl with all the people who are part of the business until I went in-house. Um, but the ability to think critically, the ability to come up with solutions, I mean, I view my job as being a problem solver. And the ability to read and interpret information, distill it, and then come up with a way to work collaboratively with people to solve that. I mean, you learn some of that in law school, but you learn a lot of it when you have to work in organizations. The thing that, that helped me most, and actually I, I, I did get an MBA just next door at uh, Fuqua while I was here. I did that, that four-year program. But I found that the thing that, that helped me most from a business perspective was the whole international expansion piece. Um, if you look, when I joined, I just, it was, it was by luck. When I joined, most of my career has been on the international side, and I still travel probably, I don't know, a third to 50 percent of the time outside the, outside North America. And especially when we were trying to expand the restaurants at Yum, because remember we went into China, we, and, and then at Hortons, we just began an international expansion strategy, and now Wendy's were trying to take what was the start and stop and make it something that really is significant from a company perspective. You learn so much because the approaches have to be different, the negotiations have to be different, what success factors in different countries, they're different, how you relate to people, and what, what makes them tick and what makes them respond, what makes them feel like they're engaged. To me, that was, that was really what made me much more effective back home and much more, and, and develop credibility with the, with the management team as the whole international piece. So, uh, I mean, for me, when I was, when I was uh, 35 years old, I had 700 lawyers reporting to me at the, uh, at the SEC. So I was, uh, you know, I left the SEC in 39, and, and when I was 39 years old. So I had already had substantial management experience. And then at Davis Polk, as a, as a, I was I was sort of a litigator, but mainly doing uh, defense work, but not not tri a trial room lawyer. But uh, I also gave a lot of advice on structuring transactions and disclosure, and so I was about half and half a, a corporate lawyer and, and half a litigator. And um, so when the opportunity came up to go inside, I I found that I was really interested in you know the business side of of banking and investment banking. But um, you know, having said that, it's you know, it's so much of the business decisions that you make in banking. It, it's such a highly regulated field that you know, reg the regulatory scheme is a is a large part of every business decision that you make. Um, so, but um, you know, I've always been attracted to the business side of it and enjoyed that part of it. Um, uh, would like to do more of that actually in, in uh, you know coming months and years, but uh, now that the litigation seems to have subsided. Uh, for me, again, not the traditional route. I at 18 had 100 employees at Satisfaction, and that was where I cut my business teeth was <laughs> starting that place. Um, but when I got to Cineplex. It took me about a year to realize I wasn't being as good and as efficient as I could be or as thorough as I could be as a lawyer papering deals when I wasn't at the table negotiating the deals. And so I raised my hand then saying I really need to be part of the business negotiation team to do my job very well and very effectively. Um, and I now encourage all the lawyers on my team to make sure they're at the table when deals are being made and being discussed. And you, you learn it immersively, and you learn it as you go. And um, as a general counsel, it's not even just a general business knowledge you need. You need to know the ins and outs of your company and how your company thinks and works and operates. Um, because as a, the lawyer side of it, you're not going to be papering what the intent was unless you really understand what your team is working towards, what the end goal is. I'd like to shift gears just a, a little bit. I mean, one of the things uh, that is also interesting about uh, general counsel and the internal function, uh, legal function uh, within companies over the years is the evolving uh, nature of the work that's done internally by lawyers within the firm as opposed to externally by external counsel. 
so I wondered if you know, each of you can maybe talk a little bit about, in general, what, what gets done internally, what gets done externally. And then Elizabeth has an interesting ongoing research project about these kinds of questions, which maybe she could speak to a little bit as well. So Gary, uh, when do you turn to outside counsel? Well, I, I just give you some numbers. I mean, and when I uh, joined Bank of America, uh, we that that year, 2011, we spent uh, 1.4 billion dollars on outside counsel. The next yeah, year, we'd be turning a lot to outside counsel. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Uh, the next year we spent 1.4 billion. I think last year we were down to 1.2. I'm hoping this year that we can actually break the, the 1 billion mark. Um, My budget is smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and and actually, as a, as a department, we actually have fewer lawyers than some of the other banks. I mean, we have about 650 uh, lawyers inside, about 1,200 employees in the, in the legal department. So just within within the company, we're a you know, pretty good sized law firm, global law firm. Um, so obviously, for we don't do, we really don't do any litigation inside. Um, that wasn't true at Morgan Stanley. We used to do our customer arbitrations inside. But for the most part, if there's a litigation, uh, we turn to outside, an outside law firm. We have, having said that, we have 65 lawyers within litigation who manage you know, work with the outside law firms on, on cases. So, uh, so, yeah, the short answer is we turn to outside law firms a lot. Um, and we have just, you know, another 30 seconds on this. We, we've tried to limit the number of outside law firms that we use on litigation. Uh, you know, one time apparently before I got there, we were using like, you know, 65 law firms. And we've taken it down now. We're largely, uh, we have 28 law firms that do our outside litigation. They probably do 90% of our outside litigation. And then uh, depending on where it is and what the issue is, we may bring in another law firm that's not part of the, the 28 that we generally use. But um, look, we're, we're, we're just in a, a business that at least in the recent past has been highly litigious. So um, I think the last I looked, we had 17,000 lawsuits filed against us, uh, including individual suits. So. Okay, so Scott, <laughs> Scott, Wendy, Wendy's and Tim Hortons are, we hope, in less litigious. Yeah, actually, I, actually, it's as you as you might expect. It's it's a totally different different scale. What what I've tried to do at all the places I've been, because I think it's more fun, and I think the attorneys find it more fun, is to essentially do everything in house, other than. As Gary said, the litigation. The litigation, what, what we generally look outside for is, is litigation and when we need particular expertise. For example, right now we're getting ready to open up our, our first restaurants in India, right? And as you go through the negotiation and the, the, the registration, nobody, nobody knows in Columbus, Ohio, what the registration requirements are in, in India and things like that. So when we need expertise, we also need to know, you know, are we, are we doing the exact right things from a legal perspective? We'll look outside for that. But as far as you know, the debt financing, the securities documents, negotiating the deals, I expect that, that all to be done in-house. And, and we'll recruit and pay accordingly so that we get attorneys that, that can do that. But quite frankly, that's, to me, that's, that's, that's the fun part. Scott, how big is your team? We have 20 attorneys, so it's not huge. Yeah. Mm. I mean, with only with only four people, uh, we we outsource a fair amount of the work, especially because it's oftentimes um, expertise specific. Whether it could be real estate work, it could be uh, mergers and acquisition work, it could be tax work. So uh, I'd say a large portion of it is is, is outsourced. Um, litigation is certainly outsourced, um, but we're trying to do what we can to avoid it as much as possible. You're four lawyers or four to four lawyers? Uh, th three lawyers and one paralegal. I'm about the same size, so I'm four lawyers in total and three paralegals called law clerks in Canada. Um, 
We do virtually everything in-house other than all commercial litigation is outsourced. Employment litigation we do internally because it's kind of fun and frankly the dollars are not high risk so it's good for the lawyers to keep them engaged and let them keep their toes in that. Um, major compliance or securities or tax issues, I always have a second set of eyes on something because you can't keep up with the evolving rules as four people on a group. Um, as we do all of our real estate in-house. I, I, my first external lawyer, or first additional lawyer I hired was a real estate expert because we have so much leasing work to be done. So he still does all of that in-house. Uh, and budgets are getting tighter and tighter, and you're having to negotiate better you know, flat rate deals with firms and different deal structures with firms. Um, and John, I'll use, I don't, don't see where he is, but I'll use his comment. He said one of the things that he found as general counsel, which is absolutely true, is calling firms, is, it's important early on to say this is what our end goal is, because the end goal is not always the same, or what an external counsel would assume the end goal to be. So the end goal isn't necessarily always, you know, win litigation at all costs. There may be other reasons you're perfectly happy to resolve something without a win. Um, yeah, but in terms of the resources, you, you insource as much as you can and you outsource what you absolutely have to. Okay, so Elizabeth, your research is relevant to some of these questions. Sure. Um, so, so one of my research areas of interest is transactional law and I've recently become interested in the question of how companies go about selecting law firms and what are the different roles played by law firms for these companies. And recently one of my empirical findings has been that for the exact same types of transactional work, um, I found that public companies tend to hire lower ranked law firms than other categories of companies, including in particular private equity owned companies. Uh, and I can think of lots of reasons why that might be the case. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on that particular question. And one explanation that I don't have any visibility into would be that the budget for outside counsel is such a visible cost center that maybe all of this has to do with just the internal politics of public companies where it's, you, you have a much easier time growing in-house counsel than hiring outside counsel. And even if the general counsel might want to hire a better law firm, a more expensive law firm, they feel constrained in that regard in a way that they don't with. One of the statements you just that. made is a better law firm, a more expensive law firm. Those are not the same thing. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I mean, one of the one of the issues is also where those expenses are allocated. So, on the private equity hedge fund side, a lot of those expenses are going to be fund expenses. So, you're you know that you're less concerned, you're you're more concerned about making sure there are absolutely no stone is going to be left unturned than you are necessarily just with saving an additional amount of a dollar. And there are only so many transactions you're making, so each transaction potentially has a higher value. Although I would say, I mean, looking at Wendy's and, and Bank of America, if there's any significant transaction that they're engaged in, I think you'll generally see whether it, you'll see generally higher, higher expense law firms on those transactions that are more prominent. So. Yeah, I was going to say, we, I, I, I'm surprised actually at your research because my experience has been uh, at least the big banks use the top law firms and they are more expensive. Um, at least they're, if you look at their, you know, the, the rates that they would cite as their standard rate, it's more expensive. Obviously, we have a lot of buying power. Um, so we have, you know, uh, I'm somewhat surprised at the extent to which the, the, the major, very prestigious law firms will we'll discount heavily uh, for work that we give them. But if anything, I, if, I, you know, if I look at my 40 years, not, not 20 years, but 40 years of, of practicing. No, uh, time goes back. <laughs> <laughs> I think if anything, the, uh, the, in terms of law firms, the rich get richer. I mean, I, I, I think the top law firms are uh, more dominant now than they were 20 years ago. And um, I don't see it finding not yeah. by me but by others and I don't think anything's gonna away. I don't think anything's gonna stop that um, it's you know for a law firm you know for a law firm say with 100 lawyers to say well you know we don't have a capital markets practice let's go out and do that um, ain't gonna happen I mean uh, maybe maybe if they acquired you know top practice from some other law firm of 50 lawyers maybe they could think about doing that but I just think the barriers to entry as time goes on uh, for for law firms getting into those, you know, the, the top brackets of securities law, banking law, corporate law become are, are more and more difficult. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in as well, and I probably disagree a bit with that. With that, with that too. And the way the way I have always done it and continue to do it is really based on what I consider to be one the complexity and two the importance of the things we're working on. For example, right now, and it's it's public, we're looking at a recapitalization that that may have some significant impacts on on how we're we're structured. We're working with Paul Weiss on that. All right, and as as you know, they're, they're, because we need to get it right. And we, and we have existing credit agreements and bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody like that we, we bring in. We had a major litigation over in Saudi Arabia, actually an arbitration, that we just prevailed in. And there was a lot at, at stake as far as developmental rights in the Middle East. We brought in Jones Day. So again, at the same time, again, we've, we've made it public that we are selling company restaurants, refranchising, typical of what some of the other uh, restaurant companies are doing. Those are more. I would say run-of-the-mill transactions. So I would not bring in a Paul Weiss for that. I would not bring in a Jones Day for that. I would not bring in Mayor Brown and somebody else we work with on a regular basis. I wouldn't bring those firms in because of the nature of that work. So that's really how how I look at it. Yeah, just just a footnote on that. I mean, I, there obviously there is you know there's commodity work yeah. that you have where I mean without mentioning the name of the law firm, we have one law firm that I think. It's like number three or number four in terms of of, of revenues um, or expenses from our side that we pay to them, um, and uh, but they, they have, we have a deal with them where they'll handle litigation for seven thousand dollars a case, flat rate. Uh, but this is litigation, not big class actions or anything. This is litigation where we try to foreclose on someone and they sue us, and uh, you know so it's they make a lot of money, but it's you know it's commodity kind of litigation. So. So, Anne. Well, I would, fortunately, I actually think very similar to Scott in this regard, and, but I don't have a lot of very complex litigation to outsource and to manage, so I don't need large law firm names for that. And even our, you know, the Toronto environment is slightly different than the New York environment. There's kind of what's known as the Seven Sisters large law firms. Um, I do use one of those for our complex tax and securities issues because you have to get it right. You can't screw that up. On an acquisition side, if it's a small side, I don't actually think about it from the, the context of hiring firms. I hire lawyers, so I hire individuals. So even within a firm, there may be people I do not want on my file, and I've made it very clear to the firm, if I see those initials, I don't pay the entire bill. So you know, I'm looking at individuals, not firms. <laughs> so Gary, Gary's thesis would be, in a way, that at the top echelons of the practice in the U.S., it's kind of like Toronto. In other words, that it's it's a larger it would be a larger number than seven, yeah. right? But it's not all of a sudden going to become fifteen. The seven is in it, Toronto, right? I think, has become five, five in the last few or years. Is it, so you're starting to yeah, see that. It's pretty stay. It's pretty stable. I, think. I would say it's like you know, fifteen law firms in New York City, maybe. Um, no, not fifty. Uh, and well, there was. Oh, Again, there was a time when it was like the big three in New York, right? Mm -hmm. It was Cravath, Davis Polk, uh, and Solomon and Cromwell. And I think, having come from Davis Polk, I have to say, I don't think that's true anymore. I mean, I think there's a, a larger group of firms that are considered top-notch law firms, certainly. You know, Paul Weiss amongst them, and Cleary, and Simpson, and it could go on. But it's, it's, a, it's a larger number. But the, uh, the power of those law I mean, it's not like, I don't expect to see another law firm that's you know 200 lawyers today break into that top group. It's a larger group, but uh, if anything, the the you know more of certainly more of the capital markets work, more of the banking work, complex transaction work. I think is getting concentrated in those in those firms. That's not to say there aren't boutiques, you know, that have you know that do well. But I think in terms of if you step back and look at sort of the macro market, that's what that's what you're looking at. So that has interesting implications between power as between the general counsel function within large corporations and private law firms, I would think, right? So, so that is to say, I mean, the, 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 that is to say there were forecasts maybe 20, 30 years ago, right, of basically greatly empowered uh, corporate general counsels relative to private law firms, but particularly in industries like Gary's, in you know, in the wake of crisis, there seems now to be a different equilibrium, 
right? Which which which, which then is is still a, a relatively powerful, significant position for the elite private bar. Okay, so uh, yes. One question for I mean I mean I guess what I would say what I've seen is especially especially as litigations die down from the financial crisis, you know, there is the pie is only getting so much bigger. So there is there is a strong, really strong competition amongst those top law firms. So from for in terms of sitting a, as an in-house counsel, you have a lot of latitude to negotiate the deals you want with the firms you want because everyone is especially with a lot the consolidation that's going on in the business people want to make sure they have ongoing recurring pieces of revenue so it's actually a great time to negotiate those deals uh, with the different firms that you're looking at because it's um it's it's hard for firms and they're very they're very nervous about retaining the business they have and trying to grow their piece of the pie yeah i i just to add to that i mean i think the the price competition is 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 stronger now and certainly, when I, when I was at you know Davis Polk in the '90s, in the '90s, you know if if I, we had a big client on a big matter and and you know they wanted a five percent discount, it would be you know people wringing their hands, you know, can we really do this? And I would say the leverage is going to be huge. We're going to make a ton of money, but well, we really don't know if we really want to. In fact, we think you ought a premium bill on this. Well, those days are gone. I mean, I. I it probably violates some kind of agreement we had with our law firms to talk about the kind of discounts we get. <laughs> Thank you I mean, for telling us that. Yeah, with, major, <laughs> with major, major law firms are prepared to discount uh, certainly well in the double digits, um, which was uh, you know, kind of unheard of at the, at the top levels back in the 90s. So while you know, the, the number of the top law firms has gone up to, an, you know, whether it is 14 or 15 law firms, uh, in, at least in New York City, um, the price competition amongst those firms is very, very strong. I'd say even six, seven years ago, you started every negotiation discussion with the firm saying, we don't discount our fees, we don't give you a break, we can't do that, you know, you're not a big enough client to warrant that. And now they say the same thing, but not with a straight face. So it's, it really has changed. <laughs> okay, so um, one thing that's that's of course you know to think about is what's the what are the things that you worry about uh so gary has a big something that he's no longer so actively worried about which would be the the truly massive litigation wave right following the crisis uh, but we think you know these are these are uh, hugely responsible jobs uh, in very significant uh, companies, so something must worry folks. So, Anne. Uh, so Cineplex has been a very entrepreneurial company for many, many, many years, and when I joined 10 years ago, as I said, there was no in-house counsel. So there are a lot of business people who have been with the company for many years. I'm still the newbie on the executive team at 11 years. The next is 22 years. My fear is these guys going rogue. They are, you know, they're very aggressive business guys, uh, and I'm saying guys, literally, they are all men other than me. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion of, you know, yes, we can get to that, that end business goal, but not necessarily in the manner you had laid out on a napkin as the way you're going to get there, because that's not going to work. So I, I worry about deals being made that, you know, I'm five years ago, I worried about it less so now that I didn't hear about until after some handshake had been made, and then I had the cleanup to do. Well. Yeah, obviously rogue, you know, whether it's traders, bankers, whatever, is always a worry. And, you know, we, and uh, that's going to happen when you have 220,000 employees. It's inevitable. And, and hopefully it's not an, a huge issue that's going to cost you billions of dollars. But I will say the one thing I do worry about, it's a, it's a phenomenon that's, that's expanding, is whistleblowers. Um, the economic incentives to whistleblowers now are so huge we just settled some key TAM actions with Justice where we had no idea what we were paying because it was part of the $16 billion number where there was no meaningful opportunity to negotiate because they wouldn't break down the $16 billion to tell us where it was going. And a lot of it ended up going to key TAM suits. So we had people get, whistleblowers get, you know, $47 million, $50 million, if you can believe it. Um, and it makes it very difficult to manage an organization when you have people who have that kind of economic incentive to either report on something or concoct a claim that then results in a government um, a, a government investigation. You know, sometimes you know, if you know, at, not, at night, you know, I'll have a not a nightmare, but a dream that someone puts in place something within our government, 
where if some employee uh, commits a fraud or, or there's an ethical breach within the Justice Department, uh, and they report on it, they whistleblow, they get a million dollars. I mean, our Justice Department was shut down. You'd have you know, half of the employees deciding that they had witnessed some problem. So it's the, managing an organization with those kind of economic incentives in place. So every time you try to fire someone, they, they decide they witnessed something three years earlier that was a violation of law, and they go to the government. I mean, it's, it costs an enormous amount of money. You're dealing with a lot of people who you know, get these reports, and it makes sense to them when the person initially reports on some violation they've witnessed. And then six months and $5 million later to the law firm who's defending, it turns out the whole thing was, was nothing. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I know that uh, you know, a lot of people applaud the whistleblower statutes and the expansion of it, but the amount of money that's involved in these things now, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it has the ability to turn people who, or, who ordinarily would be you know, candid, straightforward people and to people who are prepared to bend the truth a little in the hopes of becoming multimillionaires. And it's very, very difficult to manage an organization with that. I, you know, our government would shut down if, again, as I said before, if, if we gave out even million dollar rewards to people who reported on wrongdoing within, you know, within the IRS, for example. <laughs> Without being too pointed. Hypothetically. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> but when I look at it right now, three things Three things jump out, and, and it's three things that we're, we're focused on. And, and when I say them, they'll be pretty obvious, I think. First is global supply, right? Because today, and you've seen it recently with KFC, you've seen it recently with McDonald's. I mean, you, you spend a lot of years building up your reputation from a quality perspective. You can have some ingredient issue that comes about in Indonesia, and with social media the way it is today, it can take your reputation right down in, in a very short period of time. So on the food side, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is data breach, because right now, as, as again you probably know, we have a lot of small franchisees, and we're in the, we're in the process of moving to a single POS system, but right now we don't have that. So we've got all these different connections that we've put together to try, because obviously we want to share information, but we're sharing it through a lot of different networks, and the risk of a data breach is there, and obviously we've seen with Target and some of the rest of them what the results of that can be. And then more, more direct to our industry is the whole, what they call joint employer status, right? And what the standard is on there. You've seen that the NLRB, they're, they're, they're really taking a position on this. They've brought, thir they, they filed 13 complaints recently against McDonald's, and everybody in the industry is watching this closely. This one will be fought out, because as you probably know, it really moves the standard from direct control, which is where it's been since the 80s, to what they call indirect control that can put the, the restaurant companies, you know, potentially at risk for everything that happens on the franchisee level. So those are probably the three things right now. I mean, I'll speak a little bit more at a high level. The, I mean, reputationally, I think the key thing, the key thing I'm always worried about is, is there anything that's, anything that we're going to do that's going to show up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal? And not, and not, and not being, not yeah. feeling like we have the processes in place uh, for that. That I say as an in-house counsel, the thing that's more concerning now to me is just the failure to supervise. The fact that there is, there, it looks like there is going to continue to be more pressure from an enforcement perspective to come after in-house attorneys. Um, and that's not, you know, regardless of the processes you have in place, you know, you're not always going to be in a place where, you know, ex post you can say you've taken every step you should have taken. So that is, that is a, I think that's a real concern. If you looked, if anyone sort of saw the report they did on GM and the ignition, like my organization is significantly smaller, but if I go, if I, if I take a position on a big organization, the concerns of what are the processes in place to avoid something like a fit, an ignition switch that clearly st stalls an ongoing motor, that that doesn't get escalated and is concerned a safety issue. I want to make sure you're in a place where the lines of communication and the oversight isn't such that anyone could really take, I think, a view where that would happen. And But I think that the pressure on gatekeepers, whether it's board of directors, whether it's in-house lawyers, is just going to continue to be more hydraulic going forward. So a lot of what you know, a lot of what you've identified, though, is things that you worry about. I mean, not everything, but many things really are reputation. I mean, so food, so supply chain issues in food services, you know, reputation. Target, I think, has not yet recovered from its data be breach problems. Um, as we, you know, we know about ongoing issues, reputational issues regarding regarding banks. 
uh, the 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 risk of the employee at whatever level you know uh, who becomes rogue for one reason then then the interesting twist that Gary added of the whistleblower slash rogue right kind of ambiguity in some cases you know is a I think in the scale of that is a is a, is a new you know is a relatively new. It is. I mean, I don't know if I don't know if Professor Cox is in the audience somewhere to talk about this, but on the whistleblower requirement, like you know, you can't, you know, we're seeing additional protections on confidentiality and non-disparagement come up. You can't even force your employees to say you need to come to us first so that we can try to identify it and and fix the problem. Um, and that's you know the idea that companies shouldn't have the ability to try to fix their own problems is a real issue, both on the public side and the private side. Well, you can have a, a whistleblower who is then once they whistleblow is protected. And then they could become a multiple whistleblower because you can't fire them. So they could decide there are other issues that may, they threw that one against the wall, didn't work, they'll try something else. And meanwhile, if you try to fire them, you, you're going to be guilty of retaliation against the employee. So it's, um, and I'm, I'm glad I'm 64 years old and will be retiring soon. And I don't have to see, deal with this for the next, you know, see where it goes in five years. But it's, it's really a problem. Um, and I'm, I know a lot of people, again, applaud it. but. Um, they're not, you know, they're not managing large organizations that try to deal with those kind of economic incentives to instead of doing the right thing and reporting it up within the organization to, you know, to call the government and tell them about it and then stay quiet until the, the government comes out and does the investigation and then you put in your money claim later. Okay, well, one thing I learned long ago in my teaching career is that it's good to end on time, particularly when you're right before lunch. So this has been extraordinary, and let's thank our panelists.